In this video, we're going to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now remember that we've covered two different types of integrals, definite integrals, which are net area, and indefinite integrals, which are antiderivatives. It turns out that these two concepts are related to each other, and it's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. Today we're going to work on the understanding and interpretation of definite integrals. So here's an example. Suppose that I had a function here. It's a piecewise function, as you can see. It's a function that represents the velocity of an object. Remember that typical units for velocity could be something like say meters per second. In the initial 10 seconds, when the object is moving negative 4 meters per second, that means every second the position of the object is decreasing by 4 units. This negative velocity, therefore, corresponds to the object moving to the left. And for t greater than 10, the velocity is positive 2, so every second the position is increasing by 2. This means the object is moving to the right. We'll address the a and b questions in just a minute. Let's just draw a quick sketch of the object's motion. So we've got an object, it starts somewhere, moves left for 10 seconds at a rate of minus 4 meters per second, and then it moves right. That's just a picture of what's going on physically, or what we would see in real life. Now let's focus on answering these questions. We're going to have to graph the function in order to find the value of the definite integral. Here's a graph of the velocity function. Notice that t equals 0 and t equals 10 are included for velocity equals negative 4, so there's filled in dots on either side of this line. When t is strictly greater than 10, not equal, so there's an open circle here, the velocity is 2. We can very easily find the value of the definite integral by finding the area in between the function and the x-axis from x equals 0 to x equals 13. As you can see, the area in question boils down to a couple of rectangles. Lucky us. The value of the definite integral is simply the area of this rectangle rectangle counted as a negative number plus the area of this rectangle counted as a positive number. The first rectangle has width 10 and height 4. The second rectangle has width 3 and height 2. So the value of the definite integral is negative 34. That's the answer to part A. But now for part B, what does that mean? Well, let's think about this. This 10 is measured in seconds. The 4 is a velocity measurement. The 4 is measured in meters per second. What do I get when I multiply velocity times time? Notice that it's the distance traveled to the left because the velocity is negative in the first 10 seconds. Let's draw a rough sketch again and being a little more precise this time. The starting position is not given to us. But what we do know, for 10 seconds, it moves to the left at 4 meters per second. So the distance traveled in the first 10 seconds is 40 meters to the left. What happens after that? After 10 seconds, the velocity jumps up to positive 2, and the object starts moving to the right. How far does it travel from t equals 10 to t equals 13? Well, we multiply the velocity of 2 times 3 seconds, we get 6 for moving right. As you can see, with 40 left and 6 right, can you guess the answer to part B? What is the meaning of this negative 34? Well, we got negative 34 by adding up negative 40 plus 6. What does that mean physically speaking? Negative 40 and then plus 6. You got it. This negative 34 is essentially the change in position. If I moved 40 to the left and 6 to the right, that means that the difference between my initial position and my end position is negative 34. So what is the meaning of the definite integral? It's the change in position. The object moved 34 units to the left. That is the meaning of the definite integral in this example. Now what we just learned can be summarized in something called the net change theorem. If we take the definite integral of a velocity function, what does that represent? We found on the previous slide that it represents the change in position, the position at time b minus the position at time a. Now you might not think this is too big of a deal, but actually it's huge. There's a much grander statement that we can say. Suppose that a quantity y was changing with respect to a quantity x at some rate dy dx. Then the net area on 
the graph of dy dx is equal to the change in the y function with respect to x. Let's rephrase that one more time. And this is the real guts of the fundamental theorem of calculus. If I start with the derivative, the area on the graph of the derivative is equal to the change in the height on the original function. So operationally speaking, if I started with a derivative, such as here or here, and I want to find the area on the graph of the derivative, this is telling me there's another way to do it other than Riemann sums, other than using basic geometry and basic shapes. This is a third way that we can compute the area on the graph of the derivative is to find the antiderivative of this function and plug in B and plug in A and subtract. So let's make our statement precise now. The exact statement of the fundamental theorem of calculus is that supposing I had a continuous function from x equals a to x equals b. In order to find the area on the graph of f of x in between x equals a and x equals b, the way that I can do that is to take the antiderivative capital F and plug in b and plug in a and subtract. Now as you can see there are some extra mathematical conditions on the full statement of the fundamental theorem of calculus, namely that the function little f inside the integral must be continuous on the interval from a to b. We'll be exploring this condition a bit more later in the course. The fundamental theorem of calculus we usually abbreviate as FTC. Now let's do some examples. We're going to find the net area on the graph of x times x minus 2 using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Let's visualize what it is that we're calculating. What does the graph look like of x times x minus 2? That's x squared minus 2x. So it's a parabola. And using the factored version up here, you can see that y is equal to 0 if x is equal to 0 or x is equal to 2. So it's a parabola that goes through the axis at x equals 0 and x equals 2. Something like this. We're calculating the net area on the graph of this parabola from x equals negative 1 to x equals 3. As you can see, these are not not basic shapes. Remember a parabola is curved, so this region here is not really a triangle, and neither is this one. Similarly, this bottom half here is not a circle. Parabolas are simply a different shape than a circle. It's kind of more stretched out, so this problem cannot be done using basic geometry. We most certainly can do this problem using Riemann sums. If I told you how many rectangles to use, or whether to use a right-handed Riemann sum or left-handed Riemann sum, but we're going to use a different method method, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now our first step is to take the antiderivative of this function, and then we're going to plug in 3 and plug in negative 1 and subtract. Now how do I take the antiderivative of x multiplied times x minus 2? Remember that you cannot take the antiderivative of individual pieces here when they're multiplied. We absolutely must FOIL it first in order to take the antiderivative of the individual pieces. Now this we can do. Let's take Take the antiderivative of x squared to get x cubed over 3 and the antiderivative of 2x to get x squared. I hope you understand antiderivatives. If you don't, you need to review the video on antiderivatives. After you take the antiderivative, do not write this squiggly symbol. What we do is we just simply write a vertical line. Now we still have the 3 and the negative 1 because I still haven't plugged in and subtracted. Alright, so let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to take my answer, plug in x equals 3, and subtract what I get when I plug in negative 1. And I see that I get 4 thirds. If adding this stuff up went too fast for you, go back, pause it, check it, do it yourself, and challenge yourself to understand every single little part of every single problem. So at the end of the day, we found the net area on the graph of this parabola to be 4 thirds. Turns out there's more area above the x-axis than below. You can see my picture's a little off, but that's okay. At least it's labeled correctly. And remember, the low standards of drawing that I can do are the ones that I hold you to. As long as things are labeled correctly, we're doing okay. Let's do another example. This one's going to have a bit more meaning to it. Suppose that there's a tank of oil. We are told how fast it's leaking with the function 300 e to the minus 2t. Let's graph it so we can see what's going on. Remember, e to the minus x looks approximately like that. That's the general shape. Now to get the exact points, let's plug in t equals 0. We get e to the 0, which is 1, times 300. So at t equals 0, 
the r function or the rate function starts at 300. Since it's a negative exponential, it decreases over time. Now, we are looking for how much oil has spilled in the first 10 minutes. We're looking for the change in the oil. How do we figure out the change in the oil based on the rate? Well, using the fundamental theorem of calculus, if I take the definite integral of the rate function, that will tell me the change in the oil in the first 10 minutes. Graphically, what that means is that we're finding the area in between the function and the x-axis from t equals zero to t equals 10 on the negative exponential graph. As you can see from the picture, that will surely end up being a positive number. So we will get positive for the final answer or a positive amount that has spilled in the first 10 minutes. I'm glad that all makes sense. It should always make sense if you think it through for any problem. All right, so let's calculate the definite integral using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Remember in class, we had that the antiderivative of e to the a t dt is equal to one over a e to the a t plus c. Look back in your notes from class for that formula. So the antiderivative here, using the a value of negative two, we get 300 times one over negative two e to the minus two. Remember, after you take the antiderivative, we use the straight line instead of the curly line. Always take the initiative and simplify yourself anytime you see there's something that simplifies pretty easily. Clearly, 300 divided by 2 should be simplified before we continue. Now we're going to plug in 10, plug in 0, and subtract. The final answer is approximately 150. Try it out. Use a calculator and add these terms up. Now what are the units on the final answer? The final answer, remember, represents the change in oil. Since the oil here is measured in gallons, 150 is measured in gallons. And this represents the amount leaked in the first 10 minutes. I hope you enjoyed this video on the fundamental theorem of calculus. Make sure to brush up on your basics and talk to me one-on-one -on -one when you have some questions. See you soon.